So how do you calculate GDP and measure the economy? There are basically three methods. The expenditure approach, which counts every dollar spent in final goods or services. The income approach, the other side of that circular flow, counts every dollar earned. And then the value added approach, which counts the market value of each step in the production process. All three methods are theoretically equivalent. And when we take it to the real world and try to estimate it with real data, should yield a similar result. Let's go back to our simple model of the economy and add a few more bits to it. First, the government. They buy things too. We call that government expenditures. Well, where do they get the money to buy it from? We just have an arrow going out and they need an arrow going in, in the form of taxation from households. But not all government purchases are in the goods and services market. Sometimes they simply transfer money back. Social Security simply collects a check via taxation and returns it via check to different households. Next, Firms also buy things. We call this physical investment. When that bakery purchases an oven to make stuff, that oven came from the goods or services market, but that oven's not being used in a household, it's being used by the firm. Therefore, it's an investment to help the baker make more cakes. I think it might be a good time to discuss the different kinds of investment. The word is somewhat ambiguous in how we use it in English, but here we mean a very specific thing. First, the difference between financial investment and this physical investment. When someone says they're investing in the stock market, they're participating in the financial market. They're talking about the ownership of a share in a firm. Those are just legal pieces of paper. They do nothing directly to help in the production process. The purchasing of stocks would be included in the savings arrow. Another question is the difference between investment, which is included in GDP, and intermediate goods, which are not. When the baker buys flour and sugar, turns it into a cake, the customer also buys flour and sugar in the form of a cake. But does the customer buy a piece of the oven in that cake? No. The oven is a final good or service in its final form. So an oven is an investment, whereas the flour and sugar are intermediate goods. We're not done yet. Still one major player, gross domestic product, that domestic part, we only want to look at what's happening inside of a country. But economies interact with the rest of the world. The rest of the world sends us money, purchasing goods and services produced inside of the country, exports, we need to include that in GDP, but the country sends money abroad purchasing goods and services produced elsewhere. This needs to be subtracted from GDP. And all of these purchases in the goods or services market add up to the GDP. We got this whole neat formula for it. Y stands for GDP equals C plus I plus G plus NX or consumption plus investment plus government expenditures plus net exports, exports minus imports. Well, what does this look like in the real world? Consumption is by far the biggest component. $18 trillion or 68% of GDP goes there. And this makes sense. Remember the purpose is final goods or services. Households usually are the end product for most goods. Investment comes in at 17% or 4.6 trillion. Government expenditures are nearly the same size. And then finally, net exports are a negative 0.8 trillion or a negative 3% of GDP. This means that we import slightly more than we export. Again, this is the expenditure method. We add up all the spending in the economy. The formula to memorize C plus I plus G plus NX or 18 trillion plus 4.6 trillion plus 4.7 trillion minus 0.8 trillion is equal to $26.8 trillion as of the second quarter 2022. So that means every year we are producing over $25 trillion of new stock and new services. It's a big country, y'all. All right, next let's do the income approach. We're gonna add up all the labor income, annual salaries, wages, compensation, and then we need to add up all the capital income, profits, interest, rents. We get the total income, which is the same as the total production. All labor income plus all capital income is equal to total income. We call this gross domestic income. The total labor income is around $14 trillion, and then the total capital income is around $10 trillion. The difficult bit is the proprietor income. For unincorporated businesses, both the laborer and the owner are the same people. So it's hard to differentiate what is exactly capital versus what is exactly labor. And it's not trivial. That's $1.9 trillion worth. The income method adds up all of the income in the economy, yielding us $26.3 which is very similar. Again, we don't have the exact same number as adding up all the expenditures, and the difference we simply refer to as the statistical discrepancy, because all this data is estimated from very large, but yet not universal, statistical samples. Now, a measurement that has gotten a lot of attention among economists has been the decline over the past 50 years of the labor share of income. It had been pretty stable for nearly a half a century at well over 60 
60%. The last peak was in 1970 at 63%. There was a slight decline until the year 2000, and it's been declining since. Now it sits around 57.6%. Now one may say this drop isn't that significant, but a difference of 5 to 6 percentage points in an economy of two dozen trillion dollars, there's a lot of resources we're talking about. So economists have spent paper after paper trying to estimate the causes of this decline in labor share. If we zoom in, we can see the decline is more dramatic. The y-axis here is between 50% and 66%, and the different lines are different sectors of the economy we can measure this. The blue line is similar to the one we just looked at, looking at the entire economy. But if we look at the purple, non-financial corporate, or the orange, the business sector, or the yellow, non-farm business sector, or the green, the payroll sector, we still see that dramatic decline since the year 2000. And the question is, will this decline continue, or are we in a new equilibrium? A lot of prominent hypotheses have been put forward. Have the increases in robots and automation simply replaced labor rather than creating new tasks for labor to do? Has globalization moved a lot of labor added value to other countries? My personal opinion that the decline in labor bargaining power explains most of this. If labor doesn't have the same negotiating power, they won't be able to bargain for the same share of the pie that they used to have. Now, is this even a concern? On the one hand, the economy is the economy, economic output is economic output. So if the income is going to labor, or if the income is going to capital, it's still income, it's still part of the economy. But the other hand is that the capital is not evenly owned. For example, over 80% of the stock market is only owned by the wealthiest 10% of the population. If, if capital ownership was a little more evenly distributed, I don't think there'd be much of an issue. Because the same households who are getting less of the labor share would hypothetically also be the same households receiving more of the capital income. Where this debate ends up, and the policy responses to it, are going to be a big part of the economic conversation for the decade to come. Now let's do the next one, the value added method. Let's start off with a bike frame. It's an intermediate good. It gets sold to a factory for $100. The value added in this step is $100. The factory turns that frame into a completed bicycle, and then they sell it to a retailer for $350. 350 minus 100 means a net added value at this stage of $250. The retailer then takes the bicycle, places it in a store, curates the selection, creates a helpful customer experience, provides expertise, answers questions, gives advice, and then sells it to the customer for $400. The retail added value is 400 minus 350, or $50. The customer purchases the bicycle. GDP in this case is $400 looking at the final goods or service method, and it's 100 plus 250 plus 50, or $400 if we look at the value added method. This method really helps us think about the different sectors of an economy. These charts are neat, they go all the way back to 1840, and we can see both the distribution of output among sectors, as well as the distribution of the labor force by sector in this one. Agriculture was the dominant sector in 1840, employing nearly 70% of all workers. But the increase in industrialization, the increase in automation, and better agricultural technology meant we needed less people to produce food and the price of food got cheaper, thus freeing up resources to devote to other sectors. Initially, there was a rise in industry and manufacturing that peaked in the mid 20th century and has since been declining, again, a function of increased automation. And in the turquoise, this whole time, a higher share of the workers and a higher share of the economic output is coming from the service industries. And here they all are. Let's start at the top. Government produced $3.1 trillion of economic output. This is approximately 11% of the economy. The arts, recreation, restaurants, and other services are 6% of the economy, or $1.7 trillion. The healthcare industry, the educational services, and social services amount to 8% of the economy. We give a lot of attention to education, we give a lot of attention to healthcare, and that's how much they contribute to the economy. All the business majors are going to contribute $3.5 trillion to the economy, or 13% of the whole. The real estate sector, realtors, landlords, and commercial real estate compose of 12% of economic output. Adding up the finance and insurance sector gives us 7% of the economy. So working in the stock market is important and it gets a lot of attention, uh, but it's not the whole economy. In fact, it's just a medium-sized industry. The IT sector, information technology, $1.5 trillion or 5.5% of the economy. Getting stuff where people want to buy it, transporting and storing goods are 3% of the economy, and all of the shopping, all the Walmarts, the grocery stores, the wholesalers, and the utilities comprise nearly 14% of the economy. And now we get to the stuff. Creating stuff, manufacturing, 10.9%. The construction industry, 4% of the economy. And raw goods. This is all of the agriculture, all of the mining, all of the oil and coal extraction, 
all of the lumber and forest goods, 2.6% of the economy. Don't you remember agriculture used to be half of the output and now it's inside of another category, less than 2%. Adding up all of the goods, it's 7.5% of the economy. So when we say goods and services in today's economy, it's mostly just services. That is 82.5% of the economy. Times are different than they used to be. Some people talk about the importance of working with your hands, and that is important. 70% of our economy works specifically with their hands to build things, but it's not the whole thing. So ask yourself, what industry are you going to go into? What industry are your friends in? Do you have good anecdotal evidence of what's happening in the entire scope of the economy? Or if you want to make commentary about what's happening in the country, do you need to do some outside research beyond your circle of friends and acquaintances? So those are the different ways we can chop up our economy. In the next video, we'll talk about the strengths and limitations of GDP measures in describing our well-being.